Good afternoon. Um, uh, we have a smaller than you, far smaller than usual <coughs> group here today. I guess quite the word didn't get out, but I want to bring to your attention that uh, each week uh, there are somewhere between 200 and 400 people at NIH who are watching this proceeding live. Uh, so when you ask questions, for example, we'd ask you to use a microphone to speak loudly, not to make a speech, uh, because people write to me, they say, uh, we heard the answer, but we don't know what the question was. <clears throat> at any rate, uh, uh, I think most of you, have, many of you, I don't know if you've been here before. Uh, this, of course, is uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, and it's the logo for this course now in its 17th year. And the whole idea is that life on the other side of a bridge is never the same. And I think most people think that one of the biggest challenges in science today is to communicate uh, the incredible advances in basic biological, engineering, mathematical sciences with human health. And for that, you have to speak some common language, and that's not so readily apparent. Uh, <coughs> in the old days, like here, those two gentlemen could walk across the catwalk, and that's where we are, in effect, in this course. Now, where possible, we try to present live patients uh, about half the time. And interestingly enough, uh, amongst the main audience who are PhD students and fellows, that's something that is invariably almost at the top of the list. As one student put it, puts a human face on a disease. And that's really what we're trying to do, uh, not to inform you and overload you with all sorts of facts and figures you have to memorize, but to instill the excitement of what the challenges are, uh, both from a clinical translational standpoint and from a basic um, fundamental basis. And it's that communication bridge that we're trying to bridge. Um, today's topic has been with us ever since there were males and females, which is back in the very beginning. Uh, somewhere along the line, venereal disease changed to be sexually transmitted diseases. And I think that probably reflects the changes in societal behavior, but I'm not sure. But I, just a couple of notes that I have found interesting here. Um, I mean, the history of venereal disease is, is loaded, both from a scientific standpoint from great errors and great successes, and also from its impact on, on human history. Uh, in the uh, 19th, no, it was earlier, the 18th century, uh, uh, John Hunter, who was very famous, but one of his reasons for fame <coughs> is that uh, the father of vaccination, uh, Jenner, was his graduate student. At any rate, uh, he believed that syphilis and gonorrhea were the same disease, and so he infected some unsuspecting volunteer as well as himself, and he came down with both. Uh, he also came up with the idea, the discovery, that syphilis could be affected by heavy metals, and it led to the 100-year business of one night with Venus and a lifetime with Mercury. Uh, syphilology was a major form of medicine, in, uh, particularly in Western Europe uh, during the 18th century. Uh, Ehrlich's uh, discovery of the popularized magic bullet, the 606th compound, an organic arsenical, which killed the treponema uh, in cultures, in rabbits, and then later in people just shifted the field entirely. Um, but it wasn't until really the discovery of penicillin uh, that syphilis and gonorrhea kind of took a back seat for many reasons. For one, the chronic form of disease of syphilis, the vascular thing, the aneurysms, 
and the nervous system things have virtually disappeared. I don't think they're seen anymore. Uh, the disease itself, in effect, is, is changed. And similarly uh, with gonorrhea. But it did create a situation where people believed that all you had to do was take some penicillin and go about life with free abandon, uh, which has turned out not to be the case. Then added on top of it, of course, are the global challenges and the realization that venereal diseases or sexually transmitted diseases are more than just bacteria. Uh, by the way, Nicer, who discovered gonorrhea, uh, proved that his organism was the cause of the disease uh, by giving it to human volunteers. I don't think they knew what they were volunteering for, but he proved Koch's postulates. That was the stature, stat status of clinical investigation in the 19th and early 20th century. But then the discovery that HIV, HCV, HBV are associated with cancer began to change things because they are in part sexually transmitted. And the discovery of chlamydia and herpes, the development of drug resistance, which we'll hear about, to the particularly bacterial diseases and, dis and to the treponema. And probably a loss in public education, where in some parts of the world people knew about sexually transmitted diseases, but in other parts of the world they were deprived of it, including to some extent here. And a major topic of this afternoon's conversation uh, are based upon the discovery of human papillomavirus by Harold Zerhausen, who received the Nobel Prize in 2008 for discovery of this virus and firmly linking it to be probably the major cause of cervical cancer. Now, based upon that, Doug Lowy and John Schiller here at the NIH have spent the past many years uh, taking advantage of this discovery to develop effective vaccines uh, against uh, forms of HPV that are preventative of human cancer. So our two speakers today are leaders, global leaders in both of these uh, 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 arenas. Uh, the spur first speaker, uh, Tom Quinn, uh, is in the uh, uh, NIAID. He's an NIH distinguished investigator and has been extremely active and heads the section on international HIV and sexually transmitted research in NIAID. He's also a professor at Hopkins and he's the director of the Hopkins Center for Global Health. Now his studies have been extensive, both epidemiologic, directly, and more related to HIV and also to bacterial infection. And our second speaker is also well known to all of you, Doug Lowy, who is chief of the laboratory of cellular oncology. And since 2010, uh, as was the deputy director of the NCI. Uh, from April of 2015 until this coming October, he's been the acting director of the NCI. Uh, Doug graduated from New York University School of Medicine, trained at Stanford and at Yale, came here in 1975, and since then he and John Schiller have directed their attention both to the, to the development of effective HPV vaccines and understanding the mechanisms by which they may act. So we're most fortunate to have two outstanding uh, leaders in this field and we look forward to your talk. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Wynne. It's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciated your historical perspective on the topic we're going to be talking about uh, for the next hour. Um, 
Sexually transmitted diseases, sometimes now referred to as sexually transmitted infections, because they are not always symptomatic, uh, have been um, a major problem in morbidity uh, and even mortality uh, for humans for, for as long as we know. Um, WHO, the World Health Organization, has tried to uh, enumerate uh, how big of a problem this is currently. And they have uh, postulated that about one million people will acquire a sexually transmitted infection every day. Uh, and so over 350 million um, on an annual basis. Turns out of that 350 million, most of those are among four curable diseases that we could diagnose and treat if there was enough uh, public health attention uh, to uh, these um, bothersome infections. And 500 million people uh, in the world are estimated to have genital herpes, HPV, which we're going to be hearing a lot, uh, WHO feels somewhere over 290 million uh, women globally. And unfortunately, syphilis, which we just heard about, um, which has been with us as long as mankind's been around, right now, in the past year, almost one million pregnant women were infected with syphilis who were not diagnosed and treated and resulted in over 350,000 adverse birth outcomes to the children born to those women. To make matters worse, the bacterial STDs are developing drug resistance. Uh, and this has been increasing, particularly among gonorrhea, which has caught the public's attention as a superbug, as they like to refer to it in the press. Uh, because it has acquired resistance to our standard antibiotics at the present time. So if one takes a look at, again, at the globe, and then we'll go to the U.S., chlamydia, uh, a bacterial STD, which is by far the most commonly reported uh, uh, bacterial, S uh, uh, bacterial infection uh, to the CDC uh, on an annual basis, Worldwide, exists at about 131 million people newly acquiring it. Gonorrhea, its partner in crime, 78 million. Syphilis, 5.6 million new infections of syphilis each year. And another parasitic infection causing vaginitis, Trichomonas vaginalis, 143 million. This is how they come up with that 350 million quote, treatable or curable STIs. Of course, that doesn't count the viral STIs that I already referred to. But let's turn our attention to our country, the United States. Right now, estimated that on an annual basis, more than 20 million people will acquire both the bacterial and the viral STIs each year. Two million cases uh, uh, of the three nationally reported STDs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, were reported in 2016. That is the highest number reported to CDC ever. So we are uh, actually seeing rises, and that's what I want to spend most of my time really uh, coming across uh, and having an impact of what these diseases are doing. Who gets them is the first question. Mostly people under 25 years of age. More than half are in the young, adolescent, young adult ages. Unfortunately, they also have uh, a direct impact uh, uh, or significant health disparity with the rates often 10 times higher uh, in African Americans. And they increase the bacterial and some of the other viral ones, like herpes, increase the risk of acquiring HIV, which uh, we uh, have already heard from Dr. Fauci and others about its impact. The cost, if one was to take this to Capitol Hill, 
how much are we spending on these STDs to diagnose, try and treat them in the adverse complications? The economists come up with a figure somewhere in the range of $16 billion annually. Uh, and unfortunately, because of shifts in emphasis on healthcare delivery, the funding for screening of STDs is actually declining uh, and can pose a problem for this continued rise in STDs. So this is an old pyramid that I always like to show because it mixes the bacterial and the viral uh, STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Up at the top is syphilis, about 30,000 to 40,000 cases reported uh, each year to CDC. HIV, somewhere between 45,000 and 55,000 cases as a viral STI. And then you have hepatitis B, even though we have a great vaccine that can prevent hepatitis B, we still see about 70 to 80,000 new cases, most acquired through sexual means. And then we already talked about gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes. We're going to hear about human papillomavirus. And then, of course, uh, the uh, organism that causes vaginitis, trichomonas, uh, at over 7 million cases being acquired each year. That's where I thought I would leave about three years ago, four years ago. But I had to insert this slide because now we know that the filoviruses uh, are uh, causing uh, or being transmitted by sexually and are now being listed along with 30 other pathogens as being newly recognized STI. So Ebola and Marburg have both been shown to persist in semen of men uh, and uh, have been shown to transmit uh, mostly from men uh, to women. Zika virus, which caught the public's attention just a year ago, uh, over 17 studies have now documented sexual transmission and the presence of the virus in the semen uh, for over 180 days and some even longer. This one paper I thought I uh, would bring out is that Ebola has been shown to be transmitted uh, and present in the semen for over 500 uh, days in the survivors of Ebola. If Ebola doesn't kill you and you survive from it, uh, and we've increased the survival rate, it can uh, persist in those individuals in immunologically privileged sites and uh, be transmitted. This is a paper recently uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine shown in the red, uh, and these are the denominators of individuals who were survivors from Ebola that were followed out. Uh, so take an example here, 60 uh, individuals, men, uh, 15 out of those 60 were still shedding Ebola virus in their semen. Uh, and then it starts to drop off as you get out 13, 15 months out. But you pretty much have to assume the potential for transmission sexually could occur for at least one year and take the proper precautions uh, to preventing that. So they need to abstain from sex for a minimum of three months, if not longer. And now the recommendations are being revised because of that uh, case I just mentioned. And if abstinence is impossible, then condoms are really mandatory in, uh, in those cases. What about Zika? There's been multiple cases in the literature about sexual transmission of Zika. Uh, in the US, five clear-cut documented cases. Uh, but many other countries besides the US have reported cases. Uh, and where that's a concern is uh, if a couple uh, is uh, planning on uh, ha uh, conceiving uh, pregnancy and what they need to do if the man, in this case, uh, has traveled abroad and might have gotten exposed to the Zika virus. Basically, uh, the recommendations, which are in the MMWR, it's from CDC, basically show uh, that you should probably delay pregnancy attempts 
uh, for at least six months if the man has been shown to be to have acquired uh, Zika um, uh, to, to play it uh, safe. So they should either abstain or use condoms. And then after a period, they can be rechecked uh, and then uh, attempts of the couple to uh, conceive can be uh, started again. So that's the epidemiologic picture of these diseases that uh, we've been dealing with for so long. The next question is, what do they cause? Well, the vast majority are actually asymptomatic. They're hidden. Uh, and the National Academy of Medicine came out with uh, the hidden problem of sexually transmitted infections in the late 90s. Some of them, as shown on these slides, uh, do cause symptomatic disease, genital ulcers, syphilis, herpes, chancroid, urethritis or cervicitis, the chlamydia, the gonorrhea, mycoplasma, proctitis, rectal infection, uh, with the same bacterial STDs, but add in herpes and syphilis. Um, and even those who engage in oral genital sex, you can get pharyngitis uh, from gonorrhea and, and chlamydia, uh, as well as uh, the concern of newborn babies being born to women with either gonorrhea or chlamydia, uh, acquiring it and uh, developing a conjunctivitis. So lots of clinical syndromes. We don't have the time to go through every uh, one. Uh, and the second talk will really focus in on the clinical syndromes of HPV and how they can be prevented. Why should this be a concern for young people? Uh, besides those um, bothersome uh, clinical syndromes, uh, STDs can actually migrate into the upper fallopian tube uh, and cause upper uh, uh, tract infection, especially for women. And if there's scarring, that leads to infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. They can even cause systemic infections resulting in low birth weight uh, for the um, pregnant women uh, or even uh, abor abortion. Um, of course, STIs can enhance the transmission of HIV when we know its consequences, and they can be transmitted in the case of syphilis uh, to uh, the newborns uh, and hence be classified as congenital infection. And Wynn just described how HPV and perhaps other STIs can uh, cause um, a variety of uh, uh, cancers in the case of HPV, cervical cancer. So let me go back and go through a couple selected STIs so that you get a better flavor for these uh, organisms and what they uh, can do. This is the epidemic curve of chlamydia in the United States. You notice it's not declining, it's not flatlined, it's continuing to go up. So when I say the, the resurgence of STIs, I'm referring to graphics like these. And it's increasing more in women than it is in men, but it's also increasing in men as well. Uh, we talked about some of the numbers uh, worldwide and for the U.S., as shown here. It is the most uh, commonly reported STI in the U.S. Very high co-infection rates uh, in their sexual partners of an infected individual, so very easily transmissible. Uh, to uh, sexual partners. And you can get perinatal transmission with this organism. And untreated infections that are left undiagnosed, untreated, uh, can cause PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and that chronic pelvic pain. Now, I mentioned that it's more common in women than it is in men. This is an age distribution. So if you look here, this is uh, 15 to 19 year olds. Already uh, you're seeing a prevalence, I can tell you in Baltimore, of already 10% going up to 20% uh, in 20 to 24 year olds. So it hits the very young uh, women and also the men, but notice it does drop off uh, in the older uh, population. Either they're sexual patterns have changed, 
or it's a reflection of immunity because so many people got exposed and developed immunity uh, to this infection. I actually started work uh, here in uh, the NIH on malaria, uh, but then had a shift and started working on chlamydia. And I was struck by how similar the life cycle of chlamydia is to uh, malaria. Yes, malaria infects a red cell, chlamydia infects a columnar epithelial cell, but the life cycle for both is like 48 to 72 hours, goes through a life cycle where it's taken up, it's converted, we call it an elementary body and a reticulate body, uh, undergoes uh, this obligate uh, intercellular uh, replication, and eventually lyses the cell as malaria lyses a red cell. So very similar life cycle, only um, this one in a different uh, cellular makeup, columnar epithelial cells. Uh, and if you do a scanning electron micrograph of one of those infected cells, what you find are all these little tiny elementary bodies. Well, when that ruptures, those organisms, which are highly infectious, will infect neighboring columnar epithelial cells, continuing the infection, but are also released into the secretions of the genitalia that, during sexual intercourse, are exchanged with one person to another, and hence you transmit the uh, the infection. We can take a monoclonal antibody, uh, tag it with fluorescein, and you can see all those elementary bodies uh, that are present in on what we would call a cervical swab or a urethral swab. Now, most of the men and women, probably 80 percent, actually are asymptomatic. They don't go running to the physician or another healthcare provider to get diagnosed or treated because uh, of a, a discharge or uh, some other uh, ailment. So I put in the red that most of these individuals are asymptomatic. And so if you don't do routine screening for this in healthy individuals, especially that young group, you will miss it. Now some individuals, and this still eludes scientists today, do not know why some people have this infection and are totally asymptomatic, but are shedders. They're infectious to their partners. And the other people are developing a urethral, urethral uh, discharge, cervical discharge, epididymitis, proctitis, other types of inflammatory type of uh, discharges. We have some ideas, but we keep working on it. And unfortunately, unlike HPV, we don't have a vaccine to prevent either of these uh, 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 clinical syndromes uh, of, uh, of chlamydia. So for women, the majority, no signs or symptoms, but some, 20 percent, will develop cervicitis, uh, which are some photographs of what the clinician looks for, this erythema and redness of the, of the cervical os. And then it can migrate and cause pelvic inflammatory disease in the fallopian tube, ectopic pregnancy, as I mentioned, and infertility. And this photograph or diagram, uh, which is taken from science just two years ago, actually shows the three areas uh, that chlamydia loves to infect. So the cervical os right here, uh, causing that cervicitis or no inflammation or it eventually migrates up, especially in those asymptomatic people, and may cause more symptomatic disease uh, in the upper reproductive tract, causing that infertility or ectopic pregnancy. This is what happens to those individuals. These are unique photographs looking inside the fallopian tube on your right or uh, up in the top dome of the liver showing these fibrous adhesions that we call Fitzhugh-Curtis uh, syndrome, uh, and the surgeon has to go in and lice all these. These are extremely painful, but also when they're in the fallopian tube, they clearly will cause the infertility and problems along those lines. We 
believe we know the immunologic makeup that causes the fibrous um, uh, scarring. Um, how to prevent that from happening uh, is what's been more problematic. And the best way of preventing it uh, is early diagnosis and treatment, and we'll get to that. So PID is the biggest morbidity uh, that is associated with chlamydia. It's a, an emergency that if a woman comes in and has uh, lower quadrant uh, abdominal pain, a fever, uh, and has cervical motion tenderness, she should be admitted and put on intravenous antibiotics because left untreated could cause a, a rupture of the fallopian tube, could cause an ectopic pregnancy, could cause uh, the infertility. So that's pelvic inflammatory disease. The, chlamydia is the major cause, but there are other bacterial STIs, STDs, that do also cause it. Uh, and so we use broad spectrum antibiotics uh, when um, making the diagnosis of this. It's the most common cause of a gynecologic visit in all U.S. emergency rooms. Um, so it's, that is where uh, it's usually seen, and the clinicians there need to be uh, acutely aware of it. Now, some men, especially men who have sex with men, are at risk for one variant of chlamydia, which we call lymphogranuloma venereum. It can cause these inguinal buboes shown in your, uh, the right photo, uh, in the middle one. Uh, but if they engage in anal rectal sex, it can cause a very severe proctitis. Uh, and we treat this somewhat differently. Uh, we give them a, an antibiotic, doxycycline in this case, and treat for three weeks. The other um, more routine chlamydia is treated uh, with a single one-day dose of azithromycin, as I'll point out. So who should be tested for chlamydia? I've already showed you that young women are at extremely high risk for this infection, and so they recommend every single young, sexually active woman under 24 years of age should be screened annually uh, for chlamydia. It can be done with a urine test, can be done with a, a, a self-applied uh, vaginal uh, swab, uh, and so forth. So all women under the age of 24 uh, should be screened. And then over 24, there are certain risk factors that we apply as to whether they should be screened or not. Did they change a partner? Are they uh, practicing unprotected sex? Do they have multiple partners, e et cetera? Treatment is so easy, and this bug has no resistance that we know of. Uh, so it's a single dose of azithromycin, one gram, uh, well tolerated. And you can give that woman an extra dose to give to her sexual partner. So this has now uh, been done. It's partner treatment by the partner. Um, and uh, it started out controversial, but has now been generally accepted as one way of getting treatment to the men. Because men are not routinely screened. There's no recommendations that they should be. And it may be why chlamydia keeps going up, is because we've left out the other gender uh, in, in our approach to the public health control of that. Uh, should we do a test of cure? Actually, it's not recommended, but um, some people do. Reinfection is quite common in, in these young women, um, and so we leave that to the discretion of the clinician, depending on the individual. Um, and so we, we do recommend that in a place like inner city Baltimore or Washington, D.C., uh, they should be retested anywhere from 3 to 12 months afterwards. Now, I've covered chlamydia. I can't leave uh, without also talking about gonorrhea. Uh, I call it its twin because they present, when both are symptomatic, almost identical clinical presentations. And it can be asymptomatic as well. The sad story, and I know I'm throwing a lot of statistics at you, but the United States has the highest case rate of gonorrhea of any industrialized country. 
It's 50 times higher than that in Sweden, eight times higher than Canada. It is a national embarrassment, I, if, if I can be so glib. Um, and it's interesting because during the early AIDS epidemic, people were worried they'd practice safe sex. We actually saw everyone getting screened for gonorrhea and chlamydia in the men, and it started going down. Then we started treating HIV and, and the, the fear of uh, death from HIV started to wane a bit. And all of a sudden, we start seeing a rise once again in gonorrhea, and I'll give you one example of why that is. It's doubled in men who have sex with men who are at the greatest risk for HIV. And unlike chlamydia, antibiotic resistance is skyrocketing in this bug. Um, so here's the epidemic curve going from 1941 out to 2016. So you can see it's had its peaks and valleys and the peak was really in the mid-70s, uh, the year of, uh, the decade of love, free love, and, and a lot of multiple partners, and it's when HIV started to, to spread. Then comes the AIDS epidemic, and you can see it really did drop in the 80s and early 90s. Leveled off, and now is going up. Who's it going up in? It's going up in men, mostly, but also to some degree in women. So last year, we saw an almost a 20% increase in the rate of gonorrhea. It increased 14% in women, 22% in men. So it's happening in both. And you can see, unlike chlamydia, where we had those high rates in the young women, here it's equal, slightly higher, actually, in the men. The key age group, 20 to 30. Um, and if you take the men, and break it out to men who have sex with women versus men who have sex with men, you can see the gonorrhea rate for the last three years is definitely increasing uh, in this population. Now, one reason and only one reason, um, there's other reasons, uh, but I'm only going to talk about one, is that we are now recommending uh, that gay men take PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV. And it works. In this particular study done in San Francisco by Kaiser Permanente, over a three-year period, there was not one single case of HIV that was acquired among men taking PrEP. But look at the rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, or any STI. So they're going up. We're preventing HIV, which is the good news. The bad news is that they stop using uh, sexual protection from these STDs. So the condom use has dropped off. Multiple partners has increased. So it's a very complex scenario. The people who are put on PrEP are usually at a high risk group anyway. And so they're getting these STIs. So we have to build in messages to prevent STIs from occurring uh, when we're making prescriptions uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, I mentioned gonorrhea is developing resistance. Look at this. So we started using uh, standard antibiotics in the 40s, uh, and immediately gonorrhea developed resistance to the sulfonamides, the first antibiotics we were using. Then came along penicillin post-World War II, uh, and resistance starts developing. Then we started using the tetracyclines because it was resistant to the other ones. And what happens? Resistance. Then we started using fluoroquinolones, and they get resi the bug develops resistance. And this is chromosomal as well as plasmid-mediated. And it brings us to this current decade and uh, two drugs that we now recommend, dual therapy for anyone with gonorrhea. Dual therapy. It's almost like we're at TB treatment now. It's azithromycin with a cephalosporin, uh, and the bug is starting to develop resistance to that. These are gonococcal isolates. 
that have been collected across the U.S. This is 2016, just last year. And you can see uh, that almost a, a, a third to a half of the strains are resistant to any one of these antibiotics that I'm showing in the legend there. Now, half are still susceptible still to penicillin, which is good news, uh, but we don't, if the other half are resistant, we're not recommending penicillin. So the, the standard is that we recommend two drugs. Now, I told you we use azithromycin for chlamydia. Single dose, it works. It also works against 90%, 95% of gonococcal strains. Um, but because this resistance, and this just shows you how quickly the organism develops resistance, this is just these last two years, 2014, 2015, already we're at 3% resistance to this very strong, effective drug uh, against uh, other strains of bacteria. But it's a macrolide, and, and these organisms uh, can develop macrolide resistance quite easily. So here are the new recommendations that came out the end of 2015. You use two drugs to treat gonorrhea. This is a sad story. We've never had to go to two drug regimens. And what we fear is that we'll be going to a three drug regimen for a very common organism where we're seeing 600,000 cases a year in the U.S. So um, ceftriaxone, which is an injectable drug, plus an oral drug, azithromycin. Uh, the alternative uh, without the injectable is cefixime. That's another oral. It can be given orally or IM uh, and azithromycin. If they have treatment failure to the cefixime, we have to go back to the ceftriaxone. You must do a test of cure. We don't want to lose these two drugs. And just this last year, 2017, there was a case. Everyone wants to go to Hawaii. When they go to Hawaii, uh, um, they engage in uh, sexual practices. And unfortunately, there is a case of a cluster of multiple individuals that actually had complete resistance against azithromycin and the ceftriaxone. Um, and then we're using aminoglycosides to use that, um, which is a lot more toxic uh, for treatment. There are multiple drugs on the horizon uh, that are coming along that are in investigation, but they're at phase two. We won't see these drugs for five more years. So we sort of have to hang on to these two uh, drugs right now. And if those antibiotics run dry, in the old days, post-World War II, this is what you would see. Why it's next to a fire hydrant, I don't know. But here's your mailbox covered with penicillin, cures gonorrhea, go and get treated and, um, and be cured. Uh, but now we have that resistance, and so... If that resistance keeps going on, what I fear is we'll go back to the snake oil, uh, uh, old treatment cures, or even worse, the way it was treated before antibiotics, and that's curatage of the urethra or the cervix, extremely painful. Uh, it's to break up the strictures that, um, uh, that can be caused by that organism. So this course uh, often... Uh, has a case. I didn't bring a case with me, uh, but I'd like to share uh, uh, two cases, really. This is a 58-year-old man who presented to us with right eye pain, came into uh, the Hopkins emergency room. Uh, it's been going on for about four days. He's had no medical care for the past 20 years. He's had no sex for the past four years, and his right eye has panuveitis. You know, they, the interns were saying, I think he's got pink eye, but it hurts, it's painful. So someone had the smarts to actually do an RPR, uh, and he's positive, 1 to 128. Next step is they do a lumbar puncture, and it is also uh, RPR positive. 
uh, and he's diagnosed uh, with syphilis. And we'll come back to uh, a little description about that. About two weeks later, another individual came in, 36-year-old gay man, sudden onset of fluctuating bilateral hearing loss in tinnitus. So he had a very uh, difficult word discrimination, had a diffuse macular papular rash on his trunk, which alerted everyone this could be secondary syphilis, and lo and behold, his RPR is positive. Well, the, the answer to this story, which uh, William Ulcer uh, said a long time ago, is that he who knows syphilis knows medicine. And it's because syphilis can present in any shape or manner of, of clinical disease uh, or no disease. Uh, the organism, as you know, starts out as a chancre. Uh, photograph there. You can do a dark field or a fluorescent stain and see the organism. It can then progress to secondary form of the infection and then tertiary. These are just multiple photos of individuals with secondary syphilis. They can be mistaken for uh, human papillomavirus, but we, uh, they're called condyloma lata, um, and uh, it can be uh, present just about anywhere. Always look at the soles and palms of individuals that you might suspect of having that. Who's getting syphilis? Well, this picture looks just like I showed you for gonorrhea. It's again MSM, men who have sex with men showing a big rise of infection. What's scary about this is when you look at the MSM and you look at their HIV status, you find almost as many HIV positive people coming down with syphilis uh, as the HIV negative individuals. So these are HIV positive people. They could be on antiretroviral drugs. They may be non-infectious for HIV, but certainly infectious for syphilis. So this is a, um, a major concern. It increased um, uh, dramatically in, in both men and women. When it increases in women, you worry about congenital infection. Unfortunately, funding for screening of pregnant women in the public health clinics has dropped to almost at zero, especially in the southern states. As a result, shown in the blue bars, congenital syphilis is now increasing to the highest rate uh, of the 21st century um, and uh, continuing to go up. Uh, PNS is primary and secondary syphilis uh, in women. It's an easy organism to treat. It is not resistant to penicillin. Um, and so we treat it with benzathine penicillin, which, by the way, there's a shortage of. Uh, that's got to change. Um, uh, we can give it uh, once for the primary disease. Secondary, we give it over three weeks. And neurosyphilis, aqueous penicillin. Um, and that's exactly what we did with that ocular case. We went ahead and, and treated that individual. It's difficult to know whether there's neurosyphilis involved, but in this case it was. Any part of the eye can be involved. Uh, and we treat uh, uh, the neurosyphilis with 24 million units of penicillin because you need to get more to penetrate in. The same is true for the hearing loss. Even though that individual had secondary syphilis because of uh, the uh, neural involvement of uh, the otic system, uh, we went ahead and treated him as well. So otosyphilis has been on the increase. I've not, you know, I've been in this field for 50 years and, uh, well, maybe not that long, 40 years. Uh, and and to be honest with you, I've never seen so many cases of ocular syphilis as I have in the last year. Uh, and so that's, that's a problem. Well, I've come to the end of my talk, but I am going to just show very quickly what we need to do to change this paradigm. STD prevention and control, number one, prevention. There's no doubt about it. 
we're going to hear about the vaccine for HPV, hepatitis B should be also uh, increased. They're the only S two STIs we have a good vaccine for. Use them. <laughs> uh, detect and link to care. That means doing a lot of uh, uh, screening uh, of asymptomatic and diagnosis of the symptomatic people, treatment and follow up of those individuals. And of course, that case partner management. If you've identified a person who's infected, you need to find out how they got it, who they got it from, and get them out to treat them. There's lots of ways we can increase screening. Uh, we've developed a, an internet-based system called I Want the Kit. It's online. People can just go on their computer. They get the kit sent to them. They do a self-administered swab. The men can even just swab the uh, external part of their urethra. Uh, the women do a, a vaginal swab, send it in. They get diagnosed as to what bug they might have, and they log back in with a special code, and then they're uh, sent to, if it's positive, they're given the instructions of how to get treated um, and, and fully diagnosed. We are trying to get to rapid diagnosis. We've opened up a very new treatment, a diagnosis and treatment in the pharmacy across the street from us, Walgreens. So you can go to Walgreens and actually get screened. And if you get diagnosed, you can be treated. So this is experimental. We've only done 150 cases so far. But out of the 150, eight people were positive. So this is, this is growing. It's growing. And these are the rapid diagnostics that can be done uh, in the privacy of your pharmacy or your home. So I just want to uh, conclude and thank people who helped contribute uh, to the, this talk. I'm indebted to my four colleagues who are the real STD experts up at Johns Hopkins. Thanks very much. So I'm familiar with the doxycycline because I actually took it for my skin. Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship? It's a little scary knowing that I took something used for um, a sexually transmitted disease for oh, my skin. But I, I mean, I guess, is there something that, what's the similarity between those two, or what's the What's in doxycycline that treats both those two things? It's the antibiotic, and so when you're taking it for your skin, it's the bacterial uh, presence within the pores of the skin, and the doxycycline cleans that up, and so then the skin gets better. It also does make it into the <coughs> urethra, the cervix, and the vagina, and other places. And if a person is infected with chlamydia, you weren't, <laughs> but if they were, then uh, it, it also uh, impacts. And it's actually concentrated. I showed that life cycle. The antibiotic is concentrated in the columnar epithelial cells and, and hits the organism there. As it's trying to replicate, it can't. It stops. So that's how it works. I, I have a quick question. Sure. So with the increasing testing by uh, website and electronic means, how the results get to CDC, how they get hold of the actual spread of the disease? So, uh, great question. So all laboratories that make a diagnosis must report. Okay, so that's number one. CDC keeps track of the laboratory diagnoses. It's not always incumbent that the clinician make that report. However, we've worked it out and they uh, to try and make sure reporting's done correctly, like that Walgreens experiment that we're doing. They also tabulate it. It's on a form that goes to the state, diagnosis of chlamydia made, and then that's, that's forwarded uh, to CDC. So the reporting's actually pretty good. 
it's the reason we make estimates that are twice as high as what's reported is because that's the people who don't get diagnosed. So we say 3.5 million people with chlamydia, and so maybe it's 1.2 that get reported. That difference is the numbers that we're missing. We're missing those. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think we should uh, yeah, think go so. on, and uh, you'll have an opportunity after. <clears throat> okay, Doug. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Doug Lowy, and I'm really pleased to have been invited here to tell you uh, about the HPV vaccine, but also to tell you about HPV-associated infections uh, and the diseases that uh, are caused by, uh, by HPV. Uh, first, a disclosure. <clears throat> uh, as Dr. Arias mentioned, uh, I am involved as an inventor of the vaccine, uh, and the vaccine has been licensed uh, to the two companies that make the vaccine, Merck and GlaxoSmithKline, and I will discuss uh, potential off-label uses of the approved vaccines. One would be potentially protecting against HPV-positive oropharynx cancer, and the other is fewer doses than uh, are FDA uh, approved. I've been involved in some additional uh, technology that has been licensed to a number of different companies. This slide tells you perhaps one of the reasons why I don't have a patient to present to you. And that's because more than 40% of men and women between the ages of 18 and 59 have genital HPV infection. So if you uh, see a representative group of people who are between those ages, just under half of them statistically will have uh, HPV uh, infection. The other reason is that I'm going to be talking with you about primary prevention, and one of the great things about primary prevention is there are no grateful patients. One of the liabilities, especially when you are a cancer researcher, is the fact that nobody gets the infection or the disease, you have no grateful patients. So uh, it, it is, to some degree, a double-edged sword. The, di the issue of HPV-associated cancer is really a different issue in the developing world and in the industrialized world. And the next two slides tell you about those differences. In this, in this slide, which really is focused on low- and middle-income countries, we're focused on cervical cancer. The reason is because about 90% of HPV-associated cancer in low- and middle-income countries is cervical cancer, and about 95% of HPV-associated cancer in the developing world is, occurs in women. So only about 5% occurs in men. Shown in blue, over the next 15 years, the mortality rate uh, among women from cervical cancer in low and middle income countries is expected to go up by more than 50%. And this is a projection from the International Agency for Research on Cancer, whereas shown in red is mortality rates from cervical cancer in the industrialized world, in high income countries, where it is projected to remain more or less constant. So the big public health problem from the point of view of uh, deaths from HPV associated cancer is in low and middle income countries, and I'll repeat myself, it is almost entirely attributable to uh, cervical cancer. This is the profile, however, in the United States, which is really dramatically different. Uh, on the right side, shown in green, are the uh, HPV-positive cancers occurring in women, and on the left side, in blue, are the HPV-positive cancers occurring in men. Cervical cancer, virtually 100%, is attributable to HPV infection, uh, but in the United States, uh, about, uh, of the 31,000 
uh, estimated HPV positive cancers, about two thirds of them occur in women and about one third occur in men. And actually, there are more non-cervical uh, cancers that are HPV positive than just, H than just cervical cancer. And HPV 16 and 18, which are the two HPV types in the first generation vaccine, accounts for about 70% of cervical cancer, but about 90% of the non-cervical uh, cancers. We have pap smear screening for cervical cancer, but not for the N other HPV-associated cancers. And oropharyngeal cancer is the cancer that is rising fastest and it is predominantly a cancer of men. About three quarters of the cases occur in men. And in a recent 25-year uh, period, the incidence occur, uh, the incidence rose more than uh, more than threefold. So let me tell you a little bit about the first generation HPV vaccines. And as Dr. Arias mentioned, John Schiller and I have worked together now for more than 30 years, we've had wonderful people working in the laboratory and also uh, tremendous people to collaborate uh, with. I especially like this African saying, which if you want to go quickly, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And we have worked with a lot of different wonderful people, some of whom are, uh, are mentioned uh, here. If you're thinking about making a vaccine against HPV, Licensed vaccines are mainly preventive. They induce neutralizing antibodies is the main way in which they work. And HPVs contain viral oncogenes. And so since you're going to be giving a vaccine to a normal population, you want a subunit vaccine that's lacking in oncogenes. And there are two HPV proteins that can induce neutralizing uh, antibodies, the capsid proteins L1 and L2, L1 contains the most immunogenic neutralization epitopes, and importantly, they are conformational, which means that their tertiary structure is very important. The, and our hypothesis was that L1 by itself would self-assemble, make empty particles with correct conformation, and induce high levels of neutralizing antibody. If this hypothesis would, was wrong, Dr. Arias would not have invited me. So <clears throat> what, when Reinhard Kernbauer, who uh, is a dermatologist at the University of Vienna in Austria, when he was working in the lab, he inserted L1 into a recombinant baculovirus, infected insect cells, and indeed saw that there was self-assembly spontaneously into virus-like particles, and that when he immunized rabbits, he could uh, induce very high titers of neutralizing antibodies. He showed this first for the bovine papillomavirus because we had the necessary reagents in order to monitor neutralizing antibodies. We had a source of infectious virus. We had developed an in vitro neutralization assay previously. And so we did things first with BPV. We then went to HPV-16, which is responsible for about 50% of cervical cancer in the world and for about over 80% of the non-cervical HPV-associated cancers. It turned out that the uh, HPV-16 that virtually everyone in the world was using actually was a mutant. It did not self-assemble well, but thanks to the assistance of colleagues who uh, took HPV-16, gave it to us from non-progressed lesions, that is from uh, non-malignant lesions, the original HPV-16 reference strain, which we received from Professor Zerhausen, who, as Dr. Arias mentioned, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize 10 years ago, that was a mutant. Importantly, the, uh, and when we had the non-progressed ones, it turned out they self-assembled uh, just the same as BPV, and they induced high levels of neutralizing antibodies in contrast to the mutant, which would not have been useful for a vaccine. The virus-like particles, uh, which you see uh, here on the right, they're non-infectious and non-oncogenic. The first generation vaccines were uh, the 
bivalent vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline, the proprietary name is Cervarix. It are, is virus-like particles for HPV 16 and 18, and in principle can protect about 70% of cervical cancer and more than 90% of the non-cervical cancer. Gardasil, uh, which is the quadrivalent vaccine made by Merck, and almost all uh, people vaccinated in the United States received Gardasil rather than uh, uh, Cervarix. And Cervarix actually is no longer sold in the United States, but it is sold in many other uh, countries. Anyway, the quadrivalent vaccine, in addition to having particles for uh, 16 and 18, also has particles for HPV 6 and 11, and they account for about 90% of genital warts. And I'll be showing you some data from Australia that looks at genital warts uh, because the people in Australia almost exclusively got Gardasil, and you can look at what happens with herd immunity, which is to look at genital warts in males, although only women were immunized uh, with the vaccine. And you'll see that in a few slides. Initially, the vaccine was given in three intramuscular injections over six months. Why? Because the track record for uh, vaccines against local sexually transmitted infections was not good. Herpes simplex virus vaccines, candidate vaccines, worked well in animal models, but they didn't work well uh, when tested in people. And so what the situation you were in here was a uh, 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 animal model working well wouldn't work well in people. And so they maximized the amount of immune response by giving three intramuscular uh, injections. As you will see, part of the story post licensure is efforts to try to reduce the total number of doses that people need because it is logistically more efficient and economically less expensive to give fewer doses. What about safety? So the, there's been a lot of safety testing in the United States and elsewhere and there's really no excessive vaccine-related increased risk to pre-specified uh, outcomes. Uh, the rate of anaphylaxis in the first 600,000 uh, doses that were monitored in the U.S. was one case uh, similar to uh, other vaccines. For those of you interested in reading more about the safety studies, I strongly recommend this article by uh, Julianne G. et al. Uh, in, uh, published in 2016. It's an excellent compendium. What about the short-term population-wide impact of HPV vaccination? First, what are the goals of vaccination? I think of the goals as being twofold. First, it's to directly reduce the risk of infection and disease in, vaccine, in the vaccinees. But second, to indirectly reduce the risk by reducing the prevalence of HPV vaccine types in the general population, or what's usually referred to as herd immunity. And I'm going to show you three slides from Australia, which was an early high adopter country. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, uh, the Australian government bought vaccine and offered it free of charge to women who were of the appropriate age range, essentially from about 10 to, 20, uh, 10 to 26. And so more than 75% of eligible women uh, under the age of 20 were vaccinated. Now, <clears throat> if, you look, if you look here at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at this uh, blue-green line, these are the uh, women who, and the incidence of genital warts, uh, women who are 21 years or younger. The vertical uh, interrupted line is 2007, which is when the vaccine was started in Australia. It was approved in 2006. And what you can appreciate here is a dramatic re reduction in genital warts over the next few years in Australia. If you look at the women over 30, which is the green interrupted line, there is no such change. And the women who are between 21 and 30, 
some of whom were vaccinated, but who also had prevalent infection uh, go, uh, going on. There was a decrease, but not as dramatic as the women who were uh, under 21. What about the males of the comparable age range who did not receive uh, the vaccine, but were, because they were heterosexual, were sexual partners of these women? And again, looking here in the blue-green line, a uh, dramatic reduction in the incidence of genital warts among these uh, young men, 21 years of age and younger. And if you look at the men 30 uh, or older, uh, there's no such uh, decline. And the men who, in the, uh, who are 21 to 30 in the red interrupted line, they're in between the 21-year-old and, and, and the more than 30-year-old. Let me repeat. These men were not vaccinated. These, are, these men are benefiting from the decrease of exposure that they're getting from the women. So this is uh, presumptive evidence of herd immunity. A year ago in Australia, they published these data, which really are looking at three different classes of, HP, of HPV. Let's first look at blue, which is infection with any HPV type, because there are many genital HPV infections that are not attributable to HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18, and there's no change in those infections. However, when you look at the, uh, at the prevalence of HPV 6 and 11, shown in red, within a year or so of introducing the vaccine, the uh, prevalence goes down to close to zero. I am not showing you data for women. This is data for men. They have not been vaccinated. If you look in the green, that is HPV 16 and 18. Takes a little longer for the prevalence to go down. But again, before Australia started male vaccination, which was in 2013, the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18 has gone down dramatically among the men. The data are published for the women as well, and as you can imagine, even better than, of, than for the men. But this is direct evidence for herd immunity uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the general, uh, in, in the general population among the heterosexual men. What about the United States? First, uptake. The uptake of the HPV vaccine has been nowhere near as robust in the United States as in Australia. And let me just take you through this somewhat complicated slide from the CDC. This is looking at data through the end of 2016. When the data are published every year in the summer, they uh, basically go through the end of December of the prior, of the prior year. Uh, let's first take the uh, girls who are vaccinated, 13 to 17. That's one dose is the, uh, this top blue interrupted line, and, the, and three doses, the recommended number of doses, is this blue interrupted line, the lower. And about 65% of the girls who are eligible for the vaccine have received uh, one dose, uh, and about two-thirds of, of that number received all three doses. If you look in the red interrupted lines, those are the boys, 13 to 17. The cancer prevention recommendation uh, from the FDA and the strong recommendation for the American, uh, <coughs> uh, the CDC, was only in 2011, okay? It was 2007, uh, really, for, uh, and 2006 for girls. So in a shorter amount of time, Boys, one dose is about 50%, three doses a little less than two-thirds uh, of that. Shown here in black are the two other adolescent uh, vaccines, the uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and the meningococcal uh, vaccines. And you can see that those percentages are much, are, are much higher. Uh, the CDC, a few years ago, published the principal reasons, this is looking at the pa asking parents of boys and girls who had not been vaccinated, 
why weren't they vaccinated? And you can go uh, through, through this in, in detail, but basically uh, for parents of girls, safety was a very important uh, issue. Not necessary parents thought that their uh, children were not sexually active. Many parents uh, uh, are uh, not correct in, that, in those assessments and lack of knowledge about the vaccine uh, and it was not recommended. So the uh, parents of boys not recommended was by far the biggest thing or it was not needed or necessary, lack of knowledge. And safety concerns, much less among the parents of boys, here 7%, whereas the safety concerns here are 14% among the parents of girls. Nevertheless, there is evidence of herd immunity among the young among young girls since the vaccine was in, uh, was instituted in the U.S. This slide, which is adapted from a paper published a little less than two years ago by uh, investigators from the Centers for Disease Control, in blue here shows you the percentage of uh, girls age 14 to 19 that were positive for HPV 16 and 18. And, and, uh, and this is 2009 through 12. So uh, basically from three years to six years after the vaccine was introduced, and there's uh, about a 60% decrease in the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18, which are the viral uh, oncogenic HPV types. Looking at the other oncogenic types uh, that are not protected by the vaccine, there was only about a 10% decrease. So there's some herd immunity in the U.S., but nowhere near as striking as in Australia. To what might you attribute the efficacy uh, of the virus-like particle vaccine? Uh, in, in boys and girls who are not uh, infected and who get the vaccine, the protection is over 95%. Uh, percent. And most people, it's sterilizing immunity, which means that basically they don't even get infected. Many vaccines that are highly effective work because they reduce the level of infection and thereby reduce the development of the disease. But most of the protection uh, in most people uh, with the HPV vaccine is they don't even get infected. So we think that there are three uh, important uh, factors one is the repetitive structure of the virus-like particle is intrinsically immunogenic. The tissue-associated neutralizing antibodies exudated the potential sites of infection are a second reason. Because the levels of the exudated antibodies are high, similar to those in the serum, not the lower levels of the non-disrupted uh, genital tract. And third, very fortunately, HPV is highly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. The, for those of you who want to read more about this, uh, John and I published a paper uh, a couple of weeks ago in Vaccine that discusses this uh, issue in uh, more depth. And this just shows you what uh, a, a, this is a virus uh, particle and uh, it's a reconstruction electron micrograph and the red is a monoclonal ant neutralizing antibody that's bound to the virus particle. And you can easily imagine how the antibody bound virus will not interact with the target cell. And so you prevent infection as a result of the antibodies binding to the, uh, to the, to the, incoming, to the incoming virus. What about second generation uh, va vaccines? Uh, Merck has developed a second generation vaccine called Gardasil 9, and the goal is to protect against more HPV types. Uh, this depicts for you what, uh, looking at cervical cancer, that HPV 16 and 18 together uh, would protect against about 70% of uh, cancers, assuming no cross protection and perfect. Uh, protection against those two types. What Merck did was to add the next five most common uh, HPV types found in, uh, uh, that are found in cervical cancer. And so it's these seven 
oncogenic types plus HPV 6 and 11 for the, uh, for the genital warts. And, because, and so what they did, because it's unethical to do a placebo-controlled trial, they compared the original Gardasil, which I'll call Gardasil 4, with Gardasil 9 and used as the, as the main endpoint uh, cervical dysplasia attributable to the five new HPV types that were not present in Gardasil 4. And basically, there was about 95% protection with Gardasil 9 compared to Gardasil 4. There, were, there was one case uh, of uh, moderate and high-grade cervical dysplasia in the Gardasil 9 group versus 27 cases in the Gardasil 4 uh, group. But there still are uh, a few potentially oncogenic infections which uh, are, are not protected by, uh, by Gardasil 9, but it clearly protects against many more than Gardasil 4. So the last part is I'm going to, which is really divided into two parts, talking about increasing vaccine uptake by safely reducing the number of doses. The first is what is current standard of care. It turned out not surprisingly, because this is true of many vaccines, the immune response in girls and boys who were under 15 was stronger than in older teenagers and the young women in whom the clinical efficacy trials were carried out. These were women 18 to 23 or 25 doing the efficacy trials. And it turned out that in young adolescents under 15, two doses separated by six months produced an immune response that was even greater than the efficacy in the, uh, I I than in the efficacy trials. And th this uh, citation uh, is for the nine-valent vaccine, Gardasil 9, that was uh, published about a year and a half ago, so if you want to go and see the primary, the primary data. But this led the FDA to approve in 2016 uh, the nine-valent vaccine for adolescent girls and boys who are 9 to 14, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices from the CDC to make a strong recommendation for that. So that uh, boys and girls under the age of 15, two doses, uh, boys and girls who are over the age of 14, it's still three, it's still three doses. But the hope is that by going to two doses, that it will be easier to vaccinate uh, more people. But the last part is to say, might a single HPV vaccine dose be able to confer years of protection? And I'm going to show you some post hoc data, but I also first want to set for you what the problem is. There's a projected limited impact on worldwide cervical cancer from the current global HPV vaccination rates. Why do I say that? because only about 3% of eligible women in low and middle income countries have been vaccinated, whereas uh, about a third of eligible women in the industrialized world have been vaccinated. But as we saw before, the women in low and middle income countries account for about 90% of worldwide cancer and, uh, and, uh, and death from uh, cervical cancer, and it represents about 8% of worldwide female cancer uh, mortality. So we think that widespread global uptake of the vaccine may require decreased cost and simplified logistics. And two possible solutions are producing biosimilar vaccines, that is generic vaccines, and second, protecting vaccinees with a single dose. I will not discuss biosimilar vaccines, but there are regional manufacturers where this is under development. But I will discuss the notion of a single dose. The NCI conducted a trial of the bivalent vaccine, Cervarix, the GSK vaccine, in Costa Rica. We have been in Costa Rica studying HPV infection since the 90s because it was the most common cancer of women in Costa Rica. And uh, during the time that we have been there, the mortality rate from cervical cancer has gone down by more than one half but you can do very detailed studies, and this is 
a randomized controlled, placebo controlled trial that has finished, uh, but it was started long before the either vaccine was FDA approved. Let me first show you the data on the right, which is in the placebo group. The, blue, the green represents the HPV types that are, uh, th th that are not protected by the bivalent vaccine. The blue represents HPV 16 and 18 infection, which uh, is specifically protected. And the red represents HPV 31, 33, and 45, where there's good cross protection with the, uh, with the bivalent vaccine. That's not true of, uh, that's not true of the Merck uh, vaccine, the degree of cross protection. Now, if we go over here to the left, this is the uh, women in the trial who got all three doses of the vaccine. And you can appreciate in green, no difference in the HPV prevalence with these uh, types that are not targeted by the vaccine, but a substantial decrease in the blue and the red compared with the control groups, uh, uh, with, with the control group. Uh, but if you now look at the women who got two doses or one dose, you can appreciate that the percentage D uh, of efficacy, the vaccine efficacy, is no worse in the women who got one dose or two doses compared to the women who got three doses. And I'll point out that their exposure was very similar because the, in green, the prevalence is just the, is just the same. The bigger surprise was when we looked at antibody levels uh, where we now have been able to follow the women for over seven years and they have very stable uh, antibody levels against HPV 16 and 18 from just a single dose. That uh, HPV 16 is the interrupted red and HPV 18 the interrupted blue lines. Obviously, the antibody levels are lower than with uh, the women who got all three doses, but substantially higher than the women uh, who were naturally infected with HPV 16 and, uh, and 18. And I'll just reiterate that the women who got one dose appeared to be fully protected against the development of HPV 16 and 18 infection. This is not sufficient to change a uh, standard of care but we think that these uh, data are encouraging uh, or sufficiently encouraging to do a trial to see whether a single dose might be uh, effective uh, in preventing HPV infection. And so what we're doing in Costa Rica, and we started the trial actually in November, uh, is a forearm non-inferiority trial in 12 to 16-year-old girls, comparing protection from one and two doses of the bivalent vaccine, the GSK vaccine, and the nine-valent vaccine, Gardasil 9. It's, as I mentioned, it's unethical to have a placebo arm, so we're measuring current HPV prevalence in young women in the same area who are just too old to be eligible to get the vaccine, and that should give us a reasonable uh, notion of what the efficacy is for the vaccine. The main hypothesis is protection will be induced by one dose that will, is not inferior to the protection from two doses. And the second hypothesis is protection will be similar for one dose of either vaccine. It evaluates the possible role of the adjuvant. Uh, uh, Merck uses a standard aluminum adjuvant GSK uses a proprietary adjuvant, which is more immunogenic, which probably accounts for their having uh, higher antibody levels and more cross protection. If you want more information, uh, Amy Kramer, who's the principal investigator, uh, wrote a paper two and a half years ago in the JNCI talking about it. And also at clinicaltrials.gov, this is the identifier number that gives you some more details about the trial. The potential impact uh, if the one dose works, first it could establish a new minimum serum antibody titer needed for high level protection, which could be very useful going forward. It could provide a strong rationale for considering a repetitive structure for future vaccines. 
It could change the standard of care in the United States and globally and save more than $300 million uh, each year in vaccine costs in the United States alone. It could make it feasible to control the worldwide public health problem of cervical cancer and other HPV-associated cancer. So I don't have a patient to present to you, but I do have a sad story. Uh, many of you are familiar with the story of Henrietta Lacks, who had cervical adenocarcinoma. Uh, she was uh, uh, essentially documented in the Rebecca Sluice Pulitzer Prize uh, winning uh, story, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And the HeLa cells gave rise uh, to it. And Oprah Winfrey, before she was running for president, uh, actually starred in uh, a uh, TV drama about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. And I just want to point out that uh, she had HPV-18 uh, adenocarcinoma, died quickly of uh, really serious, uh, of serious disease. Uh, and HPV-18 adenocarcinoma is frequently not detectable by cytology, although she was not, it was just before pap smear screening became popular. But pap smear screening has done a wonderful job against squamous cell cancer of the cervix, but not against cervical adenocarcinoma. So her cancer should, not, should, should now be preventable by HPV vaccination or by HPV-based screening. I haven't talked about screening, but there have been similar advances in, in uh, cervical cancer screening as with, uh, as with vaccination. And let me just leave you with what I hope uh, will be the paradigm in a number of years in countries that don't yet have control of uh, cervical cancer, that there would be uh, a cohort of young women who would be vaccinated to give them primary prevention. Uh, but because the vaccine doesn't have therapeutic uh, 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 properties, it's not going to benefit the women who are already infected. For them, we're in the process of developing cost-effective cervical cancer screening that will be appropriate for the developing world in a number of years. And those women would then receive cervical cancer screening. And in that way, we hope that 10 years from now, we will be starting to control cervical cancer incidence and mortality on a global basis. So let me summarize. Basic research led to identification of HPV as the cause of several cancers and development of a vaccine. It's highly effective in preventing new infection and disease caused by the HPV types targeted by the vaccine. It can induce strong herd immunity and it may be possible to induce long-term protection with even a single dose, but we don't know that. That's why we do research. And finally, control of HPV-associated cancer as a worldwide public health problem may soon be feasible. Thank you very much. Look forward to your comments and questions. And if you have uh, questions for Dr. Quinn, he is still here and uh, I imagine can handle his questions much better than I could. Um, I was just wondering if you're concerned that the uh, vaccine will then shift the strain and you'll see a new rise of uh, different HPV that's not covered. So the question is, will there be an emergence of other HPV types uh, that will be uh, ca causing disease? So the the answer is in the short term, at least in the in, in, in looking out at a 10-year level, uh, both companies uh, uh, are using uh, women in Scandinavia to look for just this problem, and it doesn't seem to be uh, present. They are going to continue to look for it. If there were such an emergence, uh, it would be fairly straightforward. To, in, to essentially make virus-like particles for those types and incorporate that uh, into uh, the vaccine. I should also point out that HPV 16 and 18 really are the worst actors. So if there were an emergence of another HPV type, it wouldn't be as oncogenic as 16 and 18.
introduction of this knowledge and information and awareness to take place uh, will talk about screening women of a certain yeah. age or so I, I think that you're going to get two different answers from me and Dr. Quinn. And the reason is because when it comes to viral, inf when it comes to HPV infection, we can do something for primary prevention, and then we can do something to reduce the risk of at least cervical cancer. But we don't have an effective intervention, such as an antimicrobial agent, that would effectively treat the infection. So you, you, you really just, whereas I think that, uh, and, and so to me, the education is primarily at the level of the healthcare provider for, the, uh, for cervical cancer screening and for uh, vaccination. But Dr. Quinn may have a very different view because people need to know that they might have the bacterial infections for which there's excellent treatment. So, uh, as I mentioned, prevention is by far very dependent on education. Uh, having individuals very early on know what the consequences of having uh, unprotected sex, multiple sex partners, and so forth, does put them at risk for acquiring one of these STDs. Screening and treatment is, is one side. It's already a little bit too late for some of those individuals. It's not totally late, but we didn't really prevent them from acquiring the STD. So, um, and, and it is different with HPV, which is, can be transmitted so many different ways. Um, so I would say you start during the primary school. Uh, you know, what, uh, at what grade, I can't answer that specifically, but primary school is where individuals should be made aware of the consequences of, of uh, sexual uh, acts and sexual transmission of these agents. Now, as you move into high school, because I pointed out chlamydia is very common in the high schools, um, there it's routine screening uh, and getting, keeping the education going. Uh, that all of these diseases have consequences. You want to prevent those consequences. So be screened early uh, and get treated. Uh, we don't have, for most of them, uh, just the two uh, infections that can be prevented by vaccine. That's a different story because then you can apply vaccine at health visits. But the others don't have a vaccine. So the only way we can try to influence their transmission is through education, back to education, changing behavior or influencing behavior. The way we've done that with uh, smoking, uh, the way we've done it with car seats, the way we've done it with other types of uh, public health interventions. And they do have an impact over time. You know, I, think, I think that a very important difference is that for the bacterial diseases, you really need to change behavior. Yeah. And you need education to change behavior. Whereas, for better or worse, when you have a vaccine, the only behavior you need to change is to get people to come in and get vaccinated. I have another question to Dr. Lowry, actually. I know how sterifying a cervical cancer is and how difficult to treat. Or pharyngeal cancer is perhaps one of the most difficult in their late stages as well. And how the vaccine is being followed by oropharyngeal, both HPV infection as well as oropharyngeal incidence of tumors. So uh, the way that the vaccine was approved by the FDA for different indications was because there are pre-malignant lesions that were prevented by the vaccine. There are no such clearly identified pre-malignant lesions in the oral cavity or in the oral pharynx. And, the, and therefore, there's no FDA approval for, uh, for the vaccine 
in the or in, in the oropharynx. <coughs> the only controlled trial is the one with the women in Costa Rica, where we showed that there was very high protection. Uh, it, it, this was in post hoc analyses uh, in the women in terms of uh, protection against HPV 16. Uh, but th that is, it, that's a post hoc uh, analysis. And it's unclear, uh, the, the uh, infection rate's pretty low. It's really unclear how long it may take to see a difference uh, in oropharynx uh, cancer in vaccinees. But, you know, if you just imagine the vaccine, let's say, was introduced 10 years ago, but really in terms of uptake, let's say, five years ago. And, uh, it, 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 and mainly it's occurring in people who are, let's say, 50 years old and older. So you're going to have to wait over 30 years before you would hope to see a substantial <coughs> A, a substantial difference. So it's, it, it really is an ambiguous uh, area, but there's every reason to assume that the vaccine would work because there's, the vaccine is given, uh, you know, it is basically given intramuscular uh, and it works in one set of, uh, it, 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 it works clearly in the neogenital tract and FDA approved for a lot of different indications there and as far as we know, it, it should do the same thing. And if there is herd immunity, it should decrease the prevalence of the virus and thereby decrease exposure. Well, there are no other questions. I want to thank you both very, very much. This is really enormously exciting. And